All right, guys, can you hear me again? Yeah, we can hear you. Cool. So I know what we just did towards the last uh, part of the previous lecture. This, this is um, there's a there's a steep uh, increase in um, abstraction there. Um, so now we've seen a bit of it. Have a look at have a look at those sections and in the textbook uh, if you have the second textbook for 622 and 623 have a look have a look there and then uh, next week i'll uh, i'll go over some of it again and uh, and then um, we'll spend more time working with these sigma algebras and filtrations and the reason we do it is so we can look at conditional expectations and the reason we do that is because we want to be able to work in a multi-period but only more so hang in there with these sigma algebras and uh, filtrations. I can tell you based on past experience that <clears throat> by far most students, they will ultimately be able to, uh, to get their heads around it and, and be able to work with these conditional expectations in this abstract sense. So that's the good news. Um, the less good news is that getting over that hump, it can be a bit painful. Um, so so uh, please don't give up. Uh, it, lots and lots of students have succeeded in doing that before and, and, and you guys can too, but it will not just come for free. And it, if, if you ignore it and just pretend like we don't need to know that, this is when bad things happen because these conditional expectations, this is what underlies Martingales and Martingale theory. This is, this is what math finance, uh, when you're pricing derivatives, this is what it's all about. And this is what classes like 622 and 623 uh, they will use over and over and over. So, um, so yeah, so, so it's a, quite an important concept uh, to understand and appreciate. And um, it is also very abstract. So I guess I'm asking you guys to uh, hang in there over the next couple of weeks when we go through that material. So I'm trying to switch it up a bit and put uh, material in these lectures here that are not so challenging. By that, I don't mean to say in any way that it's easy. Uh, it is just not so abstract, it is much more concrete. Okay, so with that being said, what I wanna look at next, what I wanna look at here the last hour, it will be swaps. It is a type of contract that we haven't talked about and um, maybe also do a bit about swaptions. If I can write it in here, and swaptions. So we haven't talked about that in class and <clears throat> the next homework, as we saw earlier, uh, is full of it. So swaps, the interest rate swap that we're gonna be looking at here, that's an interest rate swap. What it does is um, you exchange, you exchange a fixed rate uh, for floating. So if, just as in uh, futures and forwards, there are like two sides of the coin. You can either be long or short. The phrases that people use here is a payer uh, or receiver. And uh, payer and receiver, these two words, this do you refer to uh, do you refer to the fixed like? So fixed means that there's a fixed interest rate you pay. Floating means that there is a random uh, to be determined interest rate that you pay slash receive. One pays uh, and one receives the fixed and one pays and the other part receives the floating. So there are two legs. There's a fixed leg and a floating leg. And the way that it is set up is that initially uh, the value of these two legs are going to be such that uh, they have such that they have the same uh, the value of, when you enter the contract is going to be zero so the value of the fixed leg is going to be exactly equal to the value of the floating leg. the um so let's break it up so you have the fixed leg 
somebody is paying fixed and somebody is receiving fixed. So the fixed leg, <clears throat> you have time points, but you're sitting here at time, uh, but you're sitting here at time uh, t, t equal to zero, for example. You're sitting here, and then there are these payments coming in your way. Um, and the fixed legs, those payments are just given by k. So at these later time points, t1, t2, up to say tn, there's a fixed payment coming in. And then you also have the floating leg. Right, so somebody's paying, if you're receiving fixed, you're paying floating and vice versa. So the floating leg, this is now different. So you're sitting here at some time, just again, this could very well be time zero. And uh, you're looking here at time points. So again, you have T1, T2. So here at some generic time point, Ti, and it runs all the way out to time Tn. At some generic time point, what happens is that the interest rate that is to work between Ti and say Ti plus one is determined. All right, so here, the, uh, the, floating, the floating rate the floating rate uh, to be paid at the next time point is determined. So some of you might have heard about variable mortgages, right? So a mortgage, you can have a fixed rate, a conventional mortgage has a fixed rate, but you can also have variable interest rates in, in mortgage structures. And, and what happens there is that you only know the rate at, you have to pay over the next period. And this is what is happening here. Like between TI and TI plus one, you know what the rate is, but you don't know what the rate is gonna be at time TI over the interval TI plus one to TI plus two. So you don't know, so for example, for example, uh, when you start out, uh, so for example, you know, you know, uh, you know the rate uh, over the interval, say T zero, which is where you start out. So if you start out at T zero, you know the rate over T0 to T1, you know the rate over T0 to T1 already at uh, time zero, but what you don't know, what you don't know the rate that you're gonna be paying or receiving over T1 to T2, right? This is random and to be determined. And it's gonna be determined at time T1. So you have stochastic interest rates and uh, the only thing you know is what is gonna happen over the next period. Okay, so that's what a swap is. One part is paying the fixed leg the other part is paying or receiving the, uh, the floating rate and the floating rate is stochastic. The fixed rate is a constant, like K is a constant. And the way that it's set up is this K here, that constant you have here is determined. So what we're doing now is talking about the mechanics of, a, of an interest rate swap. So K, K is determined Um, such that the value, and this is at time t, 
that the value of both legs uh, is that the values of both legs are equal. And that's the mechanics of a uh, of an interest rate swap. Two legs, one is fixed, the other one is floating. One is paying fixed, the other one is receiving floating, vice versa. And uh, that fixed rate is set such that the value of receiving all these constant payoffs is exactly the same thing as receiving all these uh, floating payoffs. Are there any questions on the mechanics of a uh, an interest rate swap? If not, let's try to price one. So pricing. So pricing. Um, what we're gonna the assumption we're gonna work under is that uh, say we have say zero coupon bonds. Say zero coupon bonds are trading. Say the zero coupon bonds are trading. Remember what a zero coupon bond is. A zero coupon bond is something that pays off one dollar out here, and that's the only payment it has. Right, so it has this payment at time ti. Right, so we know what the value is here. This is at our current time point. Again, it could be time zero. That value is going to be denoted by bt ti. That's how much we're willing to pay today to get one buck at time ti. And this is risk free. These are treasure. These are risk free. So we have these zero coupon bonds, and this is now possible. This is now possible to figure out, in terms of these zero coupon bonds, what these two legs should be worth. And more specifically, can we figure out what K is? This is that fixed rate that will make the two legs have, have the same value. And yes, just in terms of all these uh, zero coupon bonds, we can express the value of the two legs, and uh, we can equate them, and then we can solve uh, for a constant K. Okay, so the first thing we start out with, and that's the easiest one, right? one of the two is the, um, the easier one of the two is the, uh, the fixed rate. Right, so, so the payment, so a payment of, uh, of K, right, so what, what do we have? We have a, um, so we have a, uh, we have a notional, a notional, this is denoted by H, then we have a time step, this is denoted by delta. <clears throat> so the payment, the payment, the fixed payment, fixed payment at time uh, ti. <clears throat> what is it going to be? Well, we have the annual rate that will be k times, depending on this, could be one over twelve, a six, uh, maybe a quarter. It could be something. Could also probably just be one. So take the annual rate and then you divvy it up into however the frequency is. If it's semi annual, you divide by two. And then you multiply onto H, that's your notional. That's the payment you're going to be making at time ti. And so what's the value? Well, your fixed leg at t. And you're going to get all these future payments, and so you move them back. And the way that you move them back is simply by multiplying onto the zero coupon bond times this h delta k, and then you sum them up. All these future payments, these are these i's for which the payment comes after t. So 
So that's the value of the fixed leg. And you can see that this one here, this is to be determined. Right? That's, the, that's the rate we're seeking to determine. The fair one is the one that makes this number here be equal to the value of the floating leg. So the floating leg is hard. Because how do we get the floating leg? Switch, switch over to the floating leg. That's the bottom one. That's the one that has the random payments that depend upon what the interest rate is. Okay, so the interest rate, so the value of the floating leg, the value of the floating leg. So <clears throat> we need to move it all back to time t. So we start out with ti. So we're sitting here at ti and over that interval, we know what the rate is gonna be. So let me denote that rate by L, L of ti. The reason it's known about L, this is LIBOR. That's how we're thinking about this. This stands for LIBOR. And so that's the rate that's gonna work that's gonna work between TI and TI plus one. And we can express this rate in terms of zero coupon bonds, right? Because the zero coupon bond, if I have a zero coupon bond that's paying out $1 here, I can, I can switch it around and I can say, well, one over a zero coupon bond that matures at time TI, right? So this is TI, TI plus one. And that's the value, right? If I'm having a $1 here, then, this is the value of B TI, TI plus one. How much am I willing to pay for $1 at the earlier time step? Well, I could switch it around to get an expression for the interest. I would divide by, I would divide by that price here and divide by it here. This would tell me something about the interest. And the way that I'm gonna write it is one plus, and then we need the time step up here again. This is my Delta. And I'm gonna get the LIBOR L of uh, TI. So I'll get, I'll express this zero coupon bond price in terms of the rate. And so this is the definition of L. And if you have continuous compounding, you could also write this here as, um, like you could write this here if you wanted to do continuous compounding, you could write this here as delta L of TI. We're not gonna do that, <clears throat> but you could. So that's the LIBOR rate. I get the LIBOR rate from the zero coupon bonds. If I'm looking at the rate that's gonna take me, that's gonna work from TI to TI plus one, I can calculate that rate if I know what the zero coupon bond price is at time TI for X3 at time TI plus one. I just take one over it, and this is gonna give me an expression for the interest rate. The risk-free interest rate, this is what we call LIBOR in, in this particular setting. Okay, so <clears throat> that's the payment that's the payment that I'm going to be getting uh, at time TN. This is the payment I'm going to be getting at time TI plus one. Okay, so let me roll it all backwards. <clears throat> so we roll it all backwards. And so as usual, when you do these models, you start out here towards the, all the way to the right. All right, so the payment I'm going to be getting at time T capital N, well, that's going to be this LIBOR payment that is determined at time t capital n minus one. Okay, so we need to roll that payment back. Right, so the time, so, so at, at time tn, the payment is, uh, it's the notional, and then we have to divvy up the rate. So this is L of tn minus one. That's the payment. So the value, the value at tn, well, we have to roll it, have to roll it back. This is the payment that's coming out at time Tn. Let me roll it back to time Tn minus one. I do that by multiplying onto the zero coupon bond. Okay. So I'll do that by rolling it back. Uh, using the zero coupon bond. And I can now insert the expression that we had up here for delta L, delta L was here. So it's 
Tn minus one, Tn, there's an H, and then delta L was one divided by B, then what, Tn minus one, Tn, minus one. Okay, so then I can factor in, I get H times one minus, <clears throat> and then the zero coupon bond, B, T, N minus one. Okay, that's that value at time T N. So, so what happened was we moved the payment, we moved the last floating payment that we got here, we moved it over here. And then of course we have to add up we have to add up whatever payment we will also be getting at time tn minus one coming from the previous from the previous period. So we here was a payment at time t capital N, we moved it one back. Then there'll also be another payment coming in here. So, so the payment, so the payment, so this here was a payment at tn. So we're also going to get a payment at tn minus one. And what's the payment at tn minus one? It's exactly the same thing as what we had up here. Let's move back one period. So this is LTN minus two. So the net value at TN minus one, we've got to add these two things together. This is H times the zero coupon bond plus that H delta L Tn minus two. So the the net value I have at the second last time step is going to be what's coming from the future plus what I'm getting currently. Okay. So then what? Well, now we basically just do the same thing one more time. We uh, we plug in and. Uh, and we see what we get. We plug in and we see what we get. So uh, what 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 will we have, right? So we so we need to we need to figure out what the value the value at um, the value at time t n minus two of this of this quantity here. So this is H one minus B T N minus one T N plus that H Delta, which is what we had before. Uh, for six, actually this expression here, just one time period earlier. So it'll be one over B T N minus two T uh, N minus one minus one. So the value of getting this payment, so this is a net value at time Tn minus one. I want to figure out what is the value of this thing. Uh, what is that equal to? So the value, I need to roll this payment here back one period. And, um, what is it? Well, how do we roll the, the value back? How do we roll the value back? Well, you see, some of the things that will happen is uh, you'll have a one, and you'll have a minus one, right? So you'll cancel out. I have a one and a minus one, you will cancel out. Uh, so this here is a payment. This is payment here. This is already, this is a constant. This is already known at time tn minus two. This one here is not known. This is a zero coupon bond part. So, so the first payment to roll that back, like the value of this thing, which is what we're getting at time tn minus one, roll it back. We're looking at minus sign cos outside. So here, instead of tn minus two, we look at the zero coupon bonds value, not at time tn minus two, but its value at tn, not at tn minus one, but at tn minus two. So I need to look at the price that it has, not at time Tn, but at Tn minus two. 
The other payment over here, this is my H time, this thing, how do I move that back? How do I move that back to time uh, 10 minus two? Well, I multiply it onto the zero coupon bond just as I did before. This here will be H uh, times, so there'll be H divided by B T N minus two T N minus one. And then I'll have to multiply onto the zero coupon bond exactly what I divided by over there. And now you see the, the things will cancel and you'll end up with H times one minus, and then it's this B T N minus two T N which is exactly the same structure as what we had up here. The only thing that happens is that you need to look at zero coupon bond prices uh, at earlier and earlier times. So, so the general picture is, the general form, generally the value will be uh, H times one minus, and then it'll be B uh, T uh, T N. So this is the value of the floating leg, <clears throat> then the, to, get, to get K, so to get K, to get K you solve, uh, you solve for H one minus and then B T T N, you solve the equation where on the right hand side, you will put the value of the fixed leg. So that's the expression we have here. This will be the sum over i, so which ti is bigger than t. And then you have this h delta k times b t uh, ti. And you can see here that the k, you can move the k outside, you can cancel out h. You're gonna get here that k is a closed form expression for k. This is one minus the zero coupon bond divided by the sum. You have your delta can go outside and then the sum of the zero components. So that's the fair fixed swap rate. That's the fair fixed swap rate. Any questions? So the um, the example I want to do is is an old exam question that was given out for the pandemic back when we could uh, have written exams. Um, so let me show you the old exam question. This is problem 18, so it's this top part here. <clears throat> so the notation is, um, it's as follows. You're looking at two swap contracts. In the homework, I think there are 10 or 12 swap contracts. So here there are two, two swap contracts. <clears throat> you have a one year and a two year. And your job is to figure out what the super coupon bonds are. So what are the, what are the super coupon bonds? This is this bootstrapping that um, we talked about before. So bootstrapping, right? So <clears throat> you're given K1, K1 is 5% and K2 is uh, 10%. Those are the fair swap rates. And let's try to figure out, let's try to figure out what the zero coupon bonds are. And then we can ultimately figure out what the, um, what the fair interest rates are. Okay, so <clears throat> if you do the bootstrapping, get these two. And uh, we'll use the first expression. That's the one we have up here. So you have that K1 is equal to, uh, what would be one minus B, say T is equal to zero, and then T1. 
divided by B uh, zero and one. So this is one equation and one unknown. So you solve, and on the left-hand side, you have 5%. You solve and you're gonna get the uh, zero coupon bond for maturity, uh, T1 being one. And you solve, and this thing here becomes uh, 0 0.952. And then for the second one, <clears throat> use the same formula. Now this would be, this was 10%. So this is your K2. And what is K2 equal to? Now there'll be two payments. It will be one payment at time one, one payment at time two. So you'll have the same formula. It'll be one minus, but now this is two. So this is B02 divided by, and then you need to add up the zero coupon bonds, B01 plus B. 0, 2. And this is where the bootstrapping mechanism comes in because you already determined, you already determined B01. This is 1 minus B02 divided by, and then here you'll have 0 0.952 plus the unknown. You solve. So you have one equation in B02 as an unknown, and you're going to get, if I did this correctly, you're going to get uh, 0 0.823. And these numbers can, of course, be converted into these LIBOR rates that we were talking about before. <clears throat> this one here could be written as, uh, if you want, uh, this could be uh, the, the way that we had written it before. This would be equal to uh, 1 divided by 1 plus uh, L of T1. And this one here could also be converted into a, uh, uh, this could be converted into a, uh, into a LIBOR rate that would work from time zero to time two. So if you wanted to go right like that, you could also sometimes be written it as a risk-free rate. So you could, you could, for example, read it like this, or you could also write it as another example. If you want to convert it into interest rates, you could write this as e to the minus and then you could have an R times, uh, and then it will be two. So assuming you have the zero coupon bonds, then you can settle on your convention for how we want to write the interest rates. Here's an example of a continuously compounded interest rate. Here's an example of a discreetly compounded interest rate. And so what the homework does, let me bring it up again, what the homework does is, is doing this in a more general setting. Let's see if I can find that homework again. <clears throat> right, so here's the homework. Here's the formula. The, that one there is the formula that we just derived. And here you're given 12 swap rate quotes. And so what you need to do is, first of all, you need to bag out, you need to do this bootstrapping and figure out what these 12 zero coupon bonds are. Now, given those 12 zero coupon bonds, you can, you can com compute the, uh, the risk-free rates. All right, so then you have to decide on a convention on how you want to compound. I'm suggesting to do annual. If you don't want to do annual, you do continuously, semi-annual, however you want. So now you have the risk-free interest rates over the next 12 year period. Okay. That's what you're gonna get. By observing the swap rates, you can infer what the risk-free uh, yield curve is, and the risk-free interest rates. And so here you're then being given, let's try to do this and figure out if I have a, a company that has issued bonds, let's try to figure out how, how risky these bonds are. Right, so now company XYZ, they have, uh, they're not risk-free. So their yields should be higher. Their, their yields should be higher than these risk-free yields that you've computed up in number one, but how much higher are they? Are they compatible? It's the same company that issued them. They have different coupons, they have different prices. And so here I'm suggesting a couple of ways of doing it. There's something called an I spread and there's something called a C spread. 
And if you want to use these I spreads and C spreads, the starting point is to be able to take swap rates and convert them into a risk-free yield curve. And now use that risk-free yield curve to decide how risky, how risky are two bonds that are subject to default. Right, so that's what this exercise here is about. By far the most important part is this question number one, are you able to take these swap rates and convert them into a risk-free yield curve? This is an exercise that lots of people uh, they do on a daily basis. These quotes up here, they change over time, of course. Um, but, uh, and then so from there, you'll see how the yield curve changes over time. So when people talk about observing the risk-free yield curve, the way that you do that is by looking at uh, swapping uh, the LIBOR rate for, for a fixed rate. Are there any questions on this part? I have a few minutes left. Let me just, the last thing I want to say before we say goodbye to each other is given, given what you have here, one can then move on and look, for example, at uh, swap options. So swap options are different, you know, it's not, it's not like that. You can also look at swap options. So a swap option, they have, they don't have a zero value of time zero, but the mechanics are that you're entering a swap uh, that runs from say uh, time t zero up to time t capital N, right? So you're sitting here at an earlier time, say zero, this could be time zero. And so here, this is the swap, uh, this is the swap period. And um, you have the option, so at time t zero, you have the option Uh, you have the option to enter uh, you have the option to enter uh, to enter a swap uh, at rate let me call it something else k star right so <clears throat> you can either enter it at k star or you can enter it at the prevailing swap rate, which is this KT0, right? KT0 was the one we had from before. This was the one that was uh, one minus BT0. Should write it exactly like what we had before. BT0 uh, TN divided by, and then it was the delta, and then the sum T, uh, uh, what was it? those ti's that are bigger than t0, summing over those i's for which ti is bigger than t0, or b, and then it would be uh, t0 ti. Right, that's the fair swap rate. This is the fair swap rate at time t0. So, so you can either enter it there, or you can enter it at this fixed rate, k0. So this here is random because it involves the zero coupon bond prices at time T0, this is random. K star, K star is fixed. This is not random. So when you enter, if you hold a swap option, then you have the option to enter a swap either at rate K0, at K star or this, um, this random variable here. So, the payoff is going to be the difference. And when would you do it? Well, you're going to take a max. And then what are the payments that are going to come? Well, the payments that are going to come, are going to come at these later times, they're going to be uh, that difference times those i's for which ti is bigger than t, and then the zero coupon bond payments, b, t, zero, ti, that's the rate difference. So this is delta times H. This here is the payoff at uh, T uh, zero. So if you want to figure out what the payoff is at this payoff is what 
the swap is paying out here time t zero, you can either enter for that constant or you can enter it at the fair rate. And so when would you do it? Well, you'll only do it if it's in your favor. That's why we put the plus. Okay, so what is the value of this difference? So it depends on how many later payments are gonna be. This here is the payoff at time t zero. So if you wanna price the swap, you're gonna move this payoff, which is complicated, right? This is k t zero minus k star positive part, you're gonna move this all the way, all the way back. This is this random payoff that you wanna get here at time t zero. The question is, what is that worth over here at time t zero? And it's gonna be worth something positive because this is a positive number. That's why the plus is there. And then you're gonna be summing over those i's for which ti is bigger than t zero. These are all positive numbers. This is the notional, this is the time step, these are zero coupon run prices. This is all positive. You're gonna be paying something positive here, but how big is it? And what do you wanna put on here for the question mark? That's not gonna be zero. This one here is gonna be strictly positive. That's a swap option. So a swap option gives you the right to enter a swap at a future time for a fixed constant uh, swap rate. Uh, and of course, when you make that decision, you're going to compare that constant to uh, what is the fair uh, swap rate at that future time point. So this is going to be your payment. This is going to be your payoff at time t zero. And then how do you move it back at time t? How do you move it back to, to the time point where you're at? In other words, what is the value of this payoff here at time zero? Well, this is a complicated beast to work with. And um, we don't have it yet, but we will get there. Hopefully, this here just outlines the mechanics. Uh, it doesn't give you the pricing formula. And before we had pricing formulas for the two legs, we would equate them. Here, I don't have a good pricing expression for this question mark yet. Um, we're going to have to build models for these random variables that are involved. Like KT0 is a random variable because it involves future zero coupon run prices and also future zero coupon run prices here. We need to know how to move this random payoff back and forth in time. This requires conditional expectations. And the questions on this part. So the swap options, this is, <clears throat> this is half baked. We're not there yet. I just want to give you a little, a little preview, like how would one move conditional expectations in time? Well, we don't know that yet, but the way that we're going to be doing, how do we move random variables back and forth in time? We're going to move them back and forth in time using conditional expectations. And uh, so that's another reason for why we want to learn more about conditional expectations so we can figure out what is the price over here. Are there any questions? Otherwise, I think this is this is all I wanted to say for today. Are there any questions about the material we went through today? Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. So I just want to remind everybody that there are the office hours available. Um, your your TA Sherry, she has uh, office hours uh, Wednesday and Thursday, and I have office hours Friday morning. And um, you're welcome to bring all your your questions with you there. Um, it is a uh, it is basically impossible to have discussions about stuff like this over email, you can just see how complicated the expressions are. Um, so if you have questions, you, you need to bring them with you to office hours, either mine or Shane's. Are there any questions before we call quits? Otherwise have a good evening guys and uh, I hope to see you Friday. If not, then I'll see you next week. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Hi, Professor. You said TA office hours are Wednesday and Thursday. The syllabus says uh, Thursday and Friday. So the, the the TA's office hours are on Wednesday from 9 to 10 a.m. Right. Then they are on Thursday evenings from 9 to 10 p.m. And my office hours are Friday morning from 9 to 10 a.m. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And it's all on Zoom. So. Yeah. Anything else? Otherwise, I'll see you next week. <laughs>